All right. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. It's uh, June the 3rd, Thursday night, 7 p.m., maybe two or three minutes afterwards. I had a little bit of trouble getting this uh, to go forth live on Facebook. Uh, I'll just give it a moment here to allow people time to get on. Uh, we haven't been on uh, with a broadcast for the last two weeks. Uh, Memorial Day, uh, Thursday before Memorial Day weekend, we did not have a service. And the service before that, I was sick. I really had <clears throat> sort of a bad uh, bout with the flu. So it's good to be back tonight. I appreciate everyone being with us. Are you on the right one? Yes. Uh, uh, my wife was asking if I was on the right one. I am on the Little Rock First Gospel Church Pastor Smith page of Facebook, and it should notify uh, people. I see people are getting on, so <clears throat> I see Brother Fidel from Guatemala and Brother Brother Sister Durham, uh, Brother Quick, uh, listening tonight, and others are, are beginning to get on. I don't know that I can see everyone. I see there's 16 people. <clears throat> right now, but I don't see every one of their names. It's good to see Brother Paul David from Montreal. Anyway, I just thought tonight that, um, you know, I've been talking quite a bit. In fact, I'm sure some of you would uh, say I've talked maybe more than quite a bit about, <clears throat> uh, you know, these in, this end time event of, event of, <clears throat> Uh, this pandemic that we've gone through and going through, and hopefully it's nearing uh, being over. Uh, certainly see it it's really in our area waned way down, and we're thankful for that. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, that took us into talking quite a bit about the end time of the Gentile world, and we've talked quite a bit on the book of Revelations, and and um, I am working, I will mention that I am working on a, um, on uh, an audio commentary of the book of Revelations that um, will go through chapter and verse. Uh, it would, I'll do it on a private Zoom meeting, it'll just be me on there. I'm doing it also on a different one for the Dominican Republic where I'll have a Spanish translator, Brother Emilio Green. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm going to record that on my own computer and then I'm going to try to uh, put it in a M4, which used to be M3 format, for those that would like to, <clears throat> to have the commentary. Uh, I'm working on that. Uh, shouldn't take too awful long to finish the audio um, and then uh, hopefully maybe we can get it in written form so that uh, those who like to actually sit and look at the pages and read, maybe we'll get that done. Uh, it is difficult, I will tell you right now. It's a big book. It's a lot of information. And so I don't know. I've started it. I've went uh, through some of it. I've restarted it. and uh, But I feel... I feel comfortable about doing this audio where I can cover it. Well, you can actually see my Bible on screen. You can actually see me as I read and, and explain it and talk about it. And so <clears throat> I'm thinking that that might be the most advantageous. But anyway, it's something I would like to accomplish in my later years uh, so that the brethren would have it as a platform to study by. Um, anyway, enough said about that. Uh, tonight, I think I want to talk a little bit about uh, God's covenant, the everlasting covenant. I thought I might say something on that, just give you a breather. Uh, you know, uh, somebody talked to me today about they said, you know, reading the Bible through and listening to what we're going through, especially in the book of uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah and some of the prophets, it, say, it seems like Brother Smith, uh, they said, Brother Smith seems like he's got that gift of a prophet. 
Well, sometimes, uh, and I will admit that I do believe that, that that's, uh, uh, that's one of the gifts that operates in my ministry. I, I, I know what the gift of a prophet is. It's, it, I believe it's one of the seven spirits of God or that it work, you know, one of the seven spirits of God works through that, that gift. And I believe it's the fear of the Lord. I believe that, that the, a, a prophet's gift <clears throat> um, it puts the fear of God in people because it's a gift of judgment. It brings judgment. It also uh, it also reveals the future. It not only talks about the judgment that God has had in the past or what God's judgment is for today, but what the God's judgment is of the future. And um, and you're a man who has that gift. If he's not careful, he will he will his gift will operate quite substantially in judgment. I had a young man. He wouldn't be a young man today. He would be my age, or in fact, he was a year older than me in my church. One day he came to my house and he came, he was in the backyard talking to me and he asked me, can I, can I talk to you about something? And I said, sure. And he said, I don't want you to get mad at me. I don't, I'm not mad at you. I just want to, ask you some things. I said, okay, go ahead. I won't get mad at you. And he said, <clears throat> Brother Smith, do you realize that all you've been talking to us about is judgment, 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 judgment. He just kept on. And, and you know, I when he began to talk, I saw how sincere he was. And I also realized what he was saying was actually the truth. And uh, he said, is there anything you can talk to us about that's not judgment, didn't put us under judgment? And uh, I said, brother, I appreciate you talking to me. I said, I, I know that's uh, partly how my gift works. Uh, you know, it has not always been that way. I, when I started out in the ministry, I was very evangelistic. Uh, my wife would tell you we had home services where I had people I had a little boy one time jump up in the middle of a couch, right in the middle of me preaching in a home service, and he received the Holy Ghost. He was probably 10 or 12 years old. I was preaching, and it was very evangelistic, and he, he just received the Holy Ghost right there. I've had more than one person while I was preaching receive the Holy Ghost. I was talking in Brownsville, Texas one time, uh, and it was a minister's meeting, but it was the first night of an open, uh, excuse me, it was the first night of an open service after the minister's meeting. The first night, I think, before the minister's meeting was also open. But this was the first night it was opened after the minister's meeting. And I felt to get up and ask Brother Bud if I could, would you mind if I get up? And he said, no, if you feel to get up. And so I got up. And the Lord touched me, and while I was talking, two young girls got the Holy Ghost while I was preaching uh, there in that assembly. And uh, there's been several times, you know, that I, I I was very evangelistic early in my ministry, but then after I established a church, <clears throat> uh, you know, every church that I've been in, I, I built from the ground up. No, you know, I started it from nothing. It just seemed like God worked with me in that way. However, um, here in Little Rock is the only church that I've ever, um, I, I ever, I took over an assembly. And that was Brother Leniger's, uh, Brother Leniger uh, ordained that. And Brother Weiniger, he talked to me and broke Brother Weiniger in case of his death that I would oversee this church in Little Rock. And then when Brother Weiniger's death, health began to uh, fail, he asked me to come here, and it was very difficult. In fact, I refused several times. But finally, after the second time that God talked to me, I realized it was what God wanted me to do. And, um, of course, I moved my church from Winters, Texas, to Midland, Texas. Then we moved from there to... Uh, um, 
Odessa, Texas, which is, there's kind of like twin cities. So it wasn't in a substantial move, but we did move from one town to the other. And then <clears throat> God moved me to Springfield, Missouri, and I didn't think I would ever leave there. I was there from 1987 until 2008. In January of 2008, I took over the church here in Little Rock. And of course, I worked with Brother Weininger um, after Brother Leninger's death in November of 2002, uh, up until the time that I took the church, became the pastor here in Little Rock. And and it's a very scary thing. You know, I had a, I, I, our church was well established in, in Missouri and I hated moving, but God was in it and God has proved that out. And so, but um, I told the precious saints in, in Missouri after the move there, we moved 700 miles, seven families of us is <clears throat> what moved, made that move. And uh, it was a, it was quite a, there's quite a story behind it, but God saw us through it and things were established. And um, and I told the saints there, I said, dig your tent stakes down deep. I don't think, I don't see us leaving here. <clears throat> I certainly was thrown by Luke when I found the Lord asked me to move to Little Rock. And then lo and behold, I never told anyone to move with me, but I did uh, make it open to the, any of them that wanted to move. And of course, there was, I think, 60 some odd people that moved. Uh, it's probably more than that eventually. Uh, it's probably more closer to 70, but but there was at least 60 in that initial year, I think, within a year, probably. Something to that effect. I don't have the exact figures in my mind. But but anyway, I'm, I'm telling them again, dig your tent stakes down deep, huh? Uh, at least under my ministry. I'm, I'm not feeling like that this is going anywhere here at my age. But anyway, uh, I didn't mean to get into all that, but it's just a little history for those of you that maybe didn't know. I'm thankful to the Lord today. I'm thankful for the body of Jesus Christ. Uh, I want all of you to know, no matter where you are, some of you may be new to the body. Some of you may be in, you know, embracing this. And, uh, so many of you are maybe even born here. You've been here many years. <clears throat> we are a people that God has revealed to us the restoring body of Jesus Christ in the earth in the end of the Gentile world. The church is not fully restored yet, but we are in a restoring mode and I would say we're in the latter part of the restoring mode. And so, uh, but I want you to know, no matter what you go through, remember this. Uh, it's men and women that have stayed in the boat, you know, stayed in the body of Christ, no matter what they went through. They stuck it out. They stayed with it. And they are the people that caused us to be where we are today. Uh, you know, God had to have a foundation of people that had a deep enough vision to stay with this and uh, to follow the Lord. And so that's the glue uh, that has held us together is those that had the vision deep enough to stay through thick and thin and uh, work our ways through no matter what. You can't let a trouble uh, cause you to give up and quit. There can't be a give up and quit among the people of God. Uh, <clears throat> and so, and I believe that there are many like those today, uh, like that today, that will continue this work uh, and see it through to a fully restored church and a complete harvest in the end of the Gentile world, making up the remainder of the bride of Jesus Christ, we'll see the uh, grafting in of the Jews. Uh, I, I don't see that the Jews will be grafted in as a nation uh, all at one time. I, I'm not sure how God will do that, but I know that the way that they'll be grafted back in 
is through the new covenant. They'll accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and Messiah. I realize that their forefathers missed it. They will receive the mantle of this restored ministry, which is a type of Elijah's mantle. Elisha's a type of the Jew receiving it. And uh, so that will, uh, we, you, you'll see that in the restored church. And then of course, the millennial, a uh, thousand years, God will clean this whole thing up. It's took 6,000 years just to make up the bride, the ruling element, but the rest of the, the uh, everlasting covenant people will be uh, uh, established in the everlasting kingdom of God uh, under ever, everlasting life uh, through the thousand years and, and uh, what is redeemed out of the final resurrection there in Revelations 20. Anyway, let's talk a little bit here tonight about, uh, I wanted to mention uh, there are several covenants God made. Uh, I'll mention Noah. God made a covenant with Noah just concerning that he would never destroy the earth again uh, by flood. And he, he put a rainbow in the sky. Every time you look up and see a rainbow, you, it should remind you of the covenant he made with Noah that he would never destroy the earth again by water. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, God's always faithful to his promises. And then, uh, you know, there's, uh, God made a covenant with Abraham. Uh, look in the 12th chapter of the book of uh, Genesis. And, and some of these I may even have to look up just a little bit because, I didn't just write all this down. It's just something I sort of looked at before um, um, before I got online. So in Genesis 12 and 7, it says, um, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And, and there built he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him, and he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, saying, Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called, them, called upon the name of the Lord. Uh, if you look down into the 13th chapter, let's see here. Um, yes, the 15th verse. Uh, let me start in the 14. It said, the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, he said, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land which thou seest. To thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I'll make thy seed as the dust of the earth so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered, arise, walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it, for I'll give it thee. Then Abraham removed his tent and came uh, and dwelt in the land of Mamre, which is in Hebron, built there an altar unto the Lord. Well, we know that God made a covenant with Abraham, not only that his seed would be as the, the sand of the sea, <clears throat> there he mentioned the dust of the earth, uh, that's an, an that that uh, the book of Revelation explains that is a number that no man can number. But then the stars of the of the sky, you know, the, the stars of heaven, were to be. And we've always taught that the stars of heaven represent the bride that'll be made up to rule and reign with Him, and that the uh, sand of the sea would be the new earth people that inherit everlasting life down through the thousand years. Um, you know, I've taught there is a, um, in the trumpets, in the book of Revelation, it talks about a third part. And uh, for a long time, I asked God, what was, what is this third part? It just didn't make sense to me that God would be interested in 
uh, one third, exactly one third. Uh, uh, and so, you know, uh, you know, Ezekiel prophesied that Israel would, would uh, a third of them would be destroyed by famine, a third of them by war, and uh, <clears throat> a, a third by pestilence, and then that there would be a remnant that was sewed up into his garment. Uh, that, you know, and I don't know that that, it's just three parts. I don't know that you'd actually take that as 33 and a third percent of each of all of the people of Israel, but it was three parts in it. And that's how I've looked in the book of Revelation as a third part. The everlasting covenant was fully established in the early church and that harvest and the end of the Jewish world where eternal judgment was measured out unto life eternal or death eternal. Uh, that took place in the early church. I believe it'll take place again. That was a one third part. Another third part down here in the restored church, in the end of the Gentile world. And then there will be another third part that will be judged down through the thousand years. That eternal judgment takes place three times is the only times that I see it taking place in the Bible. Now you might say, well, Brother Smith, in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation, there's a resurrection. Yes, and every one of those people that come up in those resurrection comes from those three parts either come out of the Jewish world, the Gentile world, or the, or the millennial. And so they are a part of those, in other words, those three judgments that were set up in those three times is accomplished. It's a delayed accomplishment in the, the resurrection in Revelations 20. But it is, it is one of those three times that comes out of one of those three judgments that was set up in the judgment seat of Christ. And so uh, God made a promise to Abraham. And of course, we're part of that promise of Abraham. And then um, there was a, God made a covenant with Moses uh, concerning, uh, it was, it, it was not unconditional. It was conditional. Uh, if you do this, I'll do that. You can read it in Exodus chapters 19 and 20, which had to do with the Ten Commandments. And uh, But God did make a covenant there. And then David, God, God expressed his covenant with David, uh, which was... Uh, part of the covenant, it, it had to do with the everlasting covenant because it was a, it was as, actually a covenant that that was prophetical concerning the uh, concerning Christ, and so. But then in in Jeremiah, uh, the thirty first uh, chapter of Jeremiah, I might mention that. Um, Jeremiah 31, 31, I think you're all familiar with that, but let's just look at it. It says, behold, in those days, the days come, saith the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt which my covenant they break, although I was a husbandman unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I'll be to their, I will be their God and they'll be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know ye the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. This is talking about the new covenant. Uh, uh, Paul, Paul, uh, the apostle Paul quoted from this in the eighth chapter of, 
um, the book of Hebrews uh, when he said that, uh, let, me, let me look at that right quick. Verse eight, uh, Hebrews eight, verse eight, starting there, it says, for finding fault with them, he saith, behold, the days come saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant. And I regarded uh, them not, saith the Lord, for this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days. I'll put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they'll be to me a people, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know ye the Lord, for all shall know me. And that's talking about the people of God that accepted Christ in the end of the Jewish world. And of course, it's the same covenant that we are a part of as Gentiles that I'll mention it in the book of uh, Ephesians how that God did that from the least to the greatest. So he said, <clears throat> I'm going to put my laws in their hearts, uh, in, the, in their mind and write them in their hearts. In the 10th chapter of Hebrews, Paul turns that around, says, I'm going to write it in their minds and put it in their, uh, and put it in their hearts. In other words, you know, the heart, that's who we are, that our, our mind our intellect, that God is going to cause the word of God to become a part of us. Righteous thinking, God's way of thinking, God's way of doing things. And uh, so uh, uh, Jeremiah showed the everlasting covenant. He called it a new covenant here. Um, uh, but that, that covenant, let's, let's look at what Peter had to say about it in 1 Peter 18, 18 through 20. It says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Uh, before the foundation of the world, uh, God, the ancient of days, made the son. He, had, he created his son. Uh, he recorded it in, the, in Revelations, uh, the third chapter and the 14th verse, where he said, these, say, these things saith the amen and faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Jesus was, was the beginning of God's creation and God before the foundation determined that Jesus would come here and offer up the sacrifice that would establish the new or everlasting covenant. Um, this was, um, it, it's mentioned in the New Testament in Acts, the second chapter and the 23rd verse. And by the way, this this broadcast will be on uh, the face our, this Facebook page. And so you can go back over it if you want to go back and look at it if I'm going too fast or for you to, you know, actually keep up or take notes. Um, but it says in Acts 2.23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. In other words, it was determined that Jesus would come before the foundation of the world that he would come, he would have to redeem fallen man. God knew man would fall. He, I don't think, God did not, 
he did not cause man to fall. It he gave that freedom. He gave the freedom of will to man. He, God does not want you and I or anyone to be a puppet that you have to be righteous because God made you that way. That's why God made us a free moral agent so that we could choose. We can either choose righteousness or we can choose to go against God. My wife and I are, you know, we're in the midst of reading. We're about, we're probably 60%, close to 60%, maybe 55 or 60% of reading the Bible through together. We read almost every day together and discuss sometimes what we read. And it's, it is so amazing that how that God blesses man and God exalts man, lifts him up, blesses him with great blessings in the in the all the history of the Bible, and man gets exalted and turns away from God. Probably the best example of that is Solomon. That God gave him so much wisdom, more than any man in the world had up until that time, or maybe ever would have. He wrote the book of uh, Proverbs and Songs of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. Uh, he he had so much wisdom. He built the ta the temple, yet in he later in life turned away from God, the idols, and uh, got exalted. And uh, it's just and and then to watch the nation of Israel that turned away from God and Judah. Judah turned away, not not nearly as bad as Israel did, because Israel set up their own their own priesthood, their own ministry, their own mode of worship, which was all false. Under Jeroboam, uh, in the divided kingdom, but and God, but God had so much mercy. Uh, I was telling my wife, you know, uh, we were reading in Isaiah today where God was talking about Ephraim, referring to Israel, how that he was not going to destroy them utterly in his judgment, and but that he was a God and not a man, and that he wouldn't have that kind of destruction in mind, uh, but that he would wait, and he'd watch, and he'd eventually heal them and save them, and reconcile them. And I was telling my wife, I said, that's like our children. It's like uh, men and women have children. We love our children. And even though many of them may, they may go the way of the world and may leave the church, leave the body of Christ, but yet we love them. They're our, our children. You know, God loves them more than you do. Uh, and, but, but you see, God helps us to understand somewhat of what he's like, that we don't, we don't want to kill. We don't just because we can't condone their ungodliness or maybe they're going to the world and turning over to the flesh, lust of the flesh. But we're hoping and praying that some way they could be reconciled to God and be saved. Well, God was that way, not only with not only with all of his people, but with the whole nation of Israel and the nation of Judah, the divided kingdoms. And uh, we have to be that way. We, we cannot tolerate like God. Sometimes we have to take our hands off of our children, let them go, not condone what they're doing, and let them know that we stand against what they're doing. But yet, there's still a love. There's still, we still will reach out to them. We still have a spirit of charity towards them. Uh, they're God's children. If they ever were saved, they're God's children. They're just, uh, you know, they're just turned to the world. But God still loves them, and he still wants to save them. Well, that's the way God been all the way through the word of God. And, and when you read the Bible, if you read it through, uh, especially I've been telling everyone here in Little Rock, read your Bible through with your wife. Read it together. Discuss it as you read it. Uh, it'll help you. Uh, it'll help you. Uh, a lot of times people read the Bible, you know, and they read it just so they can say they read it, but they ain't paying any attention to what to read. Uh, <clears throat> and I understand the younger you are, the harder it is to actually get it accomplished. But especially once you get older in life, especially if you're retired or, you know, 
like my wife and I are together every morning. We drink our coffee and we do our Bible reading. Uh, we miss some days. We never hardly ever read on Sundays because that's a very busy church day for us. But uh, most other days we read our Bible uh, and we read generally more than a day's reading almost always. But And so we'll probably finish this year before September, sometime in August, we'll, we'll finish. And we're reading it chrono in chronological order. I think you'll get more out of it reading it in chronological order. So you can get it on an audio version. Uh, you can get it in chronological. My wife on the Olive Tree Bible app, which we both have, uh, it, you can you can choose your Bible reading in chronological order in that app. And of course, I have a app on my phone, which is Alexander Scorby. He's one of the greatest orators that ever read the Bible. <clears throat> when he's reading about judgment, it sounds like God judging something. When he's reading about blessing, it sounds like God blessing you. And uh, if it's something exciting, it sounds exciting. If it sounds you know, doom, it sounds like something that's been doomed uh, or plagued. Anyway, so we listen to him in the mornings. We follow it along in our Bibles and uh, we discuss what we've read. So I, I encourage that. Let me get back. Uh, just mentioning in Acts 2 and 23 how it was by God's determinate counsel before the foundation of the world that he and God together God sat down and showed Jesus what, actually what he created him for, not just to do the work, but see, God, when God beget him as a son, let me tell you something about Jesus. Jesus was created the beginning of God's creation. He was divine in heaven, but he was created to do the will of God in heaven. When he gave up his heavenly place and submitted to God's will and came to this earth and took on the form of a human, he no longer, he had a free will here on this earth and he could have fell. He was tempted in every point that man's tempted in, yet without sin. Uh, so uh, God begat him when he finished his at work here on this earth. He was he was God's begotten, uh, first begotten son when he created him in heaven, but he begot him as a, a divine person of righteousness because righteousness was worked in him. He was not made to be righteous. Let's, roll, let's read on. Uh, let me read... Uh, Acts 4 and 27 and 28. For the truth, for a truth God, the holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatsoever thy hand and the council determined before to be done. So, <clears throat> Uh, Paul reiterated, uh, and, and let's look in Ephesians, uh, the third chapter. Uh, I use this sometimes. Let me let me go to it. Ephesians three. I'm gonna have to hurry, aren't I? Um. Be verse 11. Let's see if that's where I want to start. Um, now, what he's talking about here is how Jesus, in this new covenant, he opened this covenant up. It, it was the fulfilling of Abra the Abrahamic covenant of opening it up for all the sand of the sea, as well as the stars of heaven. And so it was God's plan before the beginning of the world to start out with Israel being the orators and being the hand of God to reconcile man back to God, but only a remnant were able to 
accomplish that, but in that, God added the Gentile back in. We being a, Paul said in the 11th chapter of Romans, we being a wild olive branch, we were grafted into the, the, tame, the olive branch, which the Jews were the tame olive branch that grew up in that. Uh, verse 10 in, in Ephesians 1, um, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, and whom also we have obtained an inheritance. So he's talking to a Gentile people, the Ephesians here, first chapter, um, I mean the 11th verse. In whom we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So then he says that we should be the praise of the glory who first trusted in Christ in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believe you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession. Now see, this was according to the purpose of God. Uh, let, me, let me look right quick. Uh, if I want to mention uh, according, yeah, in the third chapter of Ephesians, the 11th verse, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, it was God's eternal purpose. Think about that. It was his eternal purpose that God would have a family of righteous people of God and that they were able to get into this everlasting covenant. That's a covenant that lasts forever. See, some of these covenants were conditional. They wouldn't last forever. You'd get it. But this covenant, you get in this covenant uh, and stay in it, it will last forever throughout eternity. And so uh, let me let me read down just a little bit. Uh, in uh, Ephesians, I'll go back to the first chapter of Ephesians 3, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. See, God planned this before uh, uh, the foundation of the world, according to his good pleasure. It was predestined that, that Jesus would come to this earth. God knew there would be a fall. Did he cause the fall? No, but he was wise enough to know there would be one. He had that kind of foreknowledge. We're serving a, a mighty God. He doesn't leave a stone unturned. He knew exactly why he created this world. He knew how he would accomplish it. And God's, God will accomplish what he set out to do. Uh, did he predestinate you to be a part of it? He predestinated, if you're in it right now, he predestinated you to be a part of it. However, you can fail God. You can, you can leave your first love. You can be, God can remove his candlestick from you uh, in the, when there is a candlestick of a restored church, God, you can you can lose out with God. But did God want? Did, God did predestinate that it was possible that you be a part of His everlasting covenant. Uh, uh, 
uh, okay, uh, the spirit of adoption, Romans 8, 15, says you receive the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Uh, when you receive, when you receive the Holy Ghost, you're born again. You're born of God's spirit. In fact, everyone ought to know that that's why Jesus came to this earth, not to just establish the everlasting covenant, but that you would be born in it and be reconciled to God through a new birth that you would be born of God's spirit. See, when we came to this world, we were born of Adam. We weren't born of God. Uh, the psalmist said, man's just a few days and full of trouble. You're born of the flesh and you're, you're given over the flesh because we're of a fallen nature of Adam, our father. But when we're born again um, uh, of the spirit of God, we, he imparts his character. His, his life, uh, you and I then have actually, uh, we have uh, two natures. We've got the nature of Adam in us and we've got the nature of God. God's nature is there to help you overcome the nature of Adam and that nature finally uh, fades away to nothing and there is no longer any Adam in you once you've reached the fullness of, uh, of the stature of the measure of Christ. Uh, Adam, uh, J Jesus did not have, he wasn't born of Adam. He was born of God. When he got here, he was born of God. He wasn't born of Adam, but he was born a human. A virgin girl gave him a body. Uh, not the, the seed of that didn't come from man, but it came from the seed that he came from God, but he came in a human body and in human form and therefore, he was a human like the first man, Adam, not in a fallen nature. He was never in a fallen nature. He was just a human like the first man, Adam. And he never sinned. God was able to hold him where God wanted Adam in Eden not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Jesus was born in a similar condition like Eden. He was, he stayed in a garden condition with God and he never did eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He was tempted by it, but he never conceived. He never sinned. It comes forth when, when sin is conceived, it brings forth death. Uh, so when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. Jesus, he, he had lust working in him but he never gave over to it and he never conceived it. God helped him in that. There's no question about it. He was in a garden condition with God and he was, God helped him in many ways, but he did have to live by faith and overcome the human nature. Uh, uh, let's look in Hebrews 10 again, that where it says in the fifth verse says, wherefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering, you would not, but a body. You have prepared me. This is, this is talking about Psalms, the 40th chapter, a quote that, that Paul makes there. He said, uh, you wouldn't sacrifice and offerings. You would not, you didn't want me to make natural sacrifice, but you, you prepared me a body that I had to offer up myself. Uh, then I said, lo, I come in the volume of the book, the Bible, Psalms 40. It is written to do your will, O God. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. And, 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 and he, he took away the first covenant, the law of Moses, that he may establish the second, the law of grace. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Such a magnificent plan uh, was established in, it, in eternity. Uh, Isaiah <clears throat> said this in the 42nd chapter of Isaiah. He said, 
Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect one, whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him at his baptism at Jordan's when he did that, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He'll not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. Uh, he's just that tender, full, tender and merciful and a smoking flax, uh, flax he will not quench. He'll bring forth judgment to truth. He'll not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the uh, coastland shall wait for his law. Thus saith God, the Lord whom created the heavens and stretched out them, uh, them out who spread forth the earth and that which come from it, who giveth breath to the people of only it, and spirit, uh, life, to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I'll keep you and give you uh, as a covenant to the people and as light to the Gentiles. And this is... Uh, uh, this is this new covenant, everlasting covenant I'm talking about that was planned before eternity. Uh, Isaiah 53, verse 11, it says, My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he'll divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the sins of many and made the intercession for the transgressors. <clears throat> uh, Paul, Paul explains this in, in Philippians, the second chapter, uh, how Jesus left heaven and came to this earth to, uh, to accomplish this work that you and I, you see it's because of the work on the cross you and I are not offering up blood sacrifices today, that it was offered up once and for all for us with the only righteous sacrifice that was ever offered at that time before any other man was made perfect. Here in Philippians 2, verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, that is before the world began. He, 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 he was in the form of God. He was deity, God's son, God's only creation, the beginning of his creation. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. That is that he was divine, that he was God's son from the beginning. And that uh, before the, how did he say it? Uh, that, uh, before the world was, I am. Uh, Jesus existed from the very first thing that was ever created was God created his son and his son created everything else. But he made himself of no reputation. This is the mind that has to be in, in you, which was in Christ Jesus. He made himself of no reputation. He gave all that up. He didn't count himself worthy. He didn't count himself be, uh, uh, you know, uh, that it was automatic, that he was going to be saved forever, but he took the form of a, a servant and be, he, he coming, he came in the likeness of man and he being found like a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name above, which is above every name. Um, God uh, justified Jesus by raising him from the dead. In other words, God accepted his sacrifice was a perfect sacrifice without blemish. Uh, he, he was without sin. Uh, God, he, he approved of Christ's life. And uh, 
and, and what was it in Psalms 2 where he said, I declare the uh, decree, the Lord has said, you are my son, this day have I begotten you. God begotten him from death back into life. But he was a different man. He was a greater being when he resurrected from the grave after he reached perfection here on earth. He was not a divine son, the highest archangel uh, that that was made to do God's will, but he learned to do God's will. He learned righteousness. He was developed in righteousness and perfected in righteousness. Here on the earth, God begot him in that righteousness. Um, in Jeremiah 32, let me read that verse to you. Verse 4, he said, I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from, from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. In Ezekiel 16, he said, I'll remember, verse 60, I'll remember my covenant made with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Ezekiel 37, 26 says, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. Now, you want to be a part of the everlasting covenant of God. I'm talking about a covenant that lasts forever. Hey, that's what God's called us to. These scriptures all pointed to it in the end of the Jewish world. And then here we are. Uh, that, that covenant's never been done away with. That promise has never been done away with. The fact that God's restored the church back to the receiving of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We've been born of the same nature the same character of God, of that same covenant that Jesus came and uh, made possible for you and I to be born again of God's life, his spirit, his nature, his very life, just like Jesus was born of it. Uh, how did Ezekiel say it? In Ezekiel 37, 26 says, Moreover, I'll make a covenant of peace with them, and it'll be for an everlasting covenant with them and I'll establish them and multiply them and I'll set my sanctuary in the midst forever. That's not talking about a natural temple or sanctuary, but it's talking about the church. It's the people of God, the righteous people of God that represent everything in that sanctuary that represented his righteousness. And so... Um, let me read the Hebrews 13, verse 20 and 21 says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will. Make you complete in every good work. How? By God, by serving him, by humbling yourself, taking on no reputation, humbling yourself before God, letting him work his work and his, his eternal purpose in you to do his will, working in you what's well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Um, Proverbs 8, 23, Jesus said, I was set up from the everlasting, from the beginning or ever the earth was. So God, it was determined by God, his determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God mentioned in Acts 2.23. Uh, Jesus said himself in Luke Luke 22, let me read that real quick and I'll, I'll, I'll end with that, I believe. Luke 22. Uh, and I believe the 22nd verse, let me look. And truly the son of man goeth as it was determined, talking about the determinate counsel of God before the foundation of the world. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. 
Jesus was talking about this when he had his last supper uh, with his apostles. Uh, back up uh, in verse 18, Jesus said to them at that supper, I'll say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. See, the kingdom of God came on the day of Pentecost. He wasn't going to drink of that, that, that Passover feast with them until the day of Pentecost. And he took the bread. This was their last supper. He, he used it to signify uh, uh, his life and what he came to do. He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In other words, when, when the fulfillment of the Passover and you actually are partaking of Christ, you're actually eating the life by the Holy Ghost and the righteousness of God's word that's anointed by his spirit. And you're drinking the wine of the life, the blood that he shed. That means the life he shed. That you're, you are partaking that that Christ partook of. Do that in remembrance of me, he said. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying this cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me at this table, and truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. That's what I was saying. It was determined before the foundation of the world that he would come and do this work and make an everlasting covenant for you and I. Saints of God, we are partakers of the graciousness of God, his great grace. And God is helping us in so, uh, so many ways. We're nearing the end of the Gentile world. We're nearing uh, the restored church. Hold on, hold on to God. The best is yet to come. Like that song is that we sing. Uh, and, uh, so uh, don't, you know, it was like the little lady in the grave that had her, wasn't it, in a, in a coffin that had her spoon. Brother Bud used to preach that little message about that. Uh, the fork, keep your fork. He said, why she got that fork? He said, she said, because the best is yet to come. It's like been waiting on dessert. Uh, so uh, hold on to God, saints. Keep your faith. God loves you. And he before the foundation of the world, an everlasting covenant was in the mind of God's eternal purpose that would be established through his son, Jesus Christ, that would come and be our example of how to overcome the Adamic fallen nature and enter into God's eternity. Don't give up on God. He will never give up on you. If there's a broken reed, he'll try to heal it. If there's a smoking flax, he'll fan it, try to bring forth a spark of life to it. Hold on to God, saints. Stick with it. Stick with this through thick and thin. Don't ever give up on God because he will never give up on you. And if you never give up on him, you will make it. God will see to it. That, if you'll just be faithful to him and serve him, that's as much as you can do. The rest is left up to him. And I'm here to tell you tonight, he is faithful. He'll stick with you closer than a brother. He'll give up his life for his brother. He already has and proved himself and his love for you and I. All right, God bless your hearts. Thanks for listening to me tonight. Um, remember to pray for a precious saint in our church, Sister Julie Lacey had a stroke here about a week or so ago, and uh, she's doing fairly well. She's still having a hard time. You know, she did have some slur in her speech. She had her, her, I believe, left side, left arm, left leg. She's walking with a walker now. She's able to move her arm some, but she's not got full movement back. If you would pray with me that God would restore her completely. She needs a healing in her body. She's got uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, many, she's got 
many ailments in her body. Let's pray that God would touch Sister Julie Lacey Crafton, Brother Mike and Sister Julie Crafton. Remember them in your prayers. Brother Emilio Green in the Dominican Republic, uh, he needs our prayers. He's really had a bad bout of the of the flu like I had here about a week ago. <clears throat> but he's much better now. He's doing better, but keep praying for him. He needs prayer in his body, uh, a touch from God. Pray for the works in the Dominican Republic. Pray for the works, Brother Bud's works. If you would, please, I care about Brother Bud's works, and I'm sure all the brethren in the body do. Uh, Brother White, I think, is doing a great job in Nacogdoches, and Brother Duncan also in, in Sebastopol, and then Brother Memo Cano working uh, with Brother, Wright, Brother White and also working, continuing to work along with Brother Hugo Rodriguez and the work in Mexico. And, uh, but there's needs in, in the Mexico work that needs the hand of God to bring uh, God's, uh, to stabilize everything. You know, when, brother, when a man of God like Brother Bud leaves off the scene, it takes time for people to get stabilized again. Please remember those works. Pray for the work in Mexico. Brother Rodriguez, he's got a heavy burden on his shoulders down there in that mother church in Brownsville. And the brothers, those that Brother uh, John Bud worked with, Brother Johnny Bud was closer to me than a brother. And that's just the way it's, that's just the truth. I love him. I love my brother. I miss him today. I talk to him almost every day on the phone for many, many years. And I miss him in a way that you may not ever understand. But anyway, pray with me uh, concerning these things, the Dominican Republic, Brother uh, Fidel in uh, Guatemala City, Guatemala. We've got a brother from El Salvador that is visiting, I believe, this coming week uh, in the Dominican Republic. I want him to visit the churches there in La Romana. Uh, he's got a son there. So pray for that. We've got several things working in the Dominican Republic. And if you would pray that God, right now, I can't go over there. If I do, uh, I can't come back with unless I have a negative test of COVID-19. COVID-19 is still pretty bad in the Dominican. I've had my vaccinations and I do plan on going over there by October, but I'm hoping that that a stipulation by the United States is done away with by that time uh, because if you do pass top, test positive, you can't come back, not until you pass, pass, test negative. So if you get COVID over there, you're staying over there, you're either gonna, oh, you're either gonna live over it or die with it. And uh, I'd just like to be able to come home if, if you know, uh, I, I really feel like it'd be okay for me to go sometime in October, but pray with me concerning that. Um, pray for the minister's meeting at the campground that starts the 14th here in a couple of weeks. Less than that, 11 more days at, at the campground. Brother Dave's and the brethren there will be meeting there. Pray for that meeting. Pray for, pray for your ministry, your leaders. God knows we need to see eye to eye and we need God's help. And in all the work that we do to do his will, we can't get ahead of him, but we certainly don't want to lag behind. So pray for God's ministry uh, in your daily prayers. God bless all of you. Uh, I will uh, pray for you. You pray for me. God bless your hearts and have a good night. I'll see the local church Sunday morning. I'm looking forward to our Bible study at 10 o'clock, breakfast at 9.30, service upstairs.